Hi, I'm Naomi Judd. On today's show, now you may know her as Blair on One Life to Live. I think there's a little bit of Blair in all women. In real life, I don't get to go and slap somebody in the face or shoot you somebody. You don't? No, God, don't get away with that. <laughs> but around here, she's known as a proud little country girl with an angelic voice. The Emmy-nominated Cassie DePaiva is here. Plus, women in their 60s who have wisdom and personality show us what we have to look forward to. People are always trying to scare women by saying that if you're over 50 or 55 that you can't find love, but that's not true. I did, and it didn't take me very long either. So go ahead, pour yourself another cup of coffee, get ready to spend the next interesting hour with me. I'm Naomi Judd. You're going to be glad you did because it's a brand new morning. Every day's a new day. Every day's a new way to help somebody who needs somebody like you. There's a power you can pass along to heal a heart and make it strong. There's hope with every dawn. Every day's a new day. Hiya. Good morning. Glad to see you all. How would you like your eggs and bacon this morning? Oh, <laughs> thank you all for waking up with me. Um, I'm very happy that you guys have joined me on today's show because I have some very strong opinions. What? Me opinionated? Who knew? Some very strong ideas about aging. My new book, Naomi's Guide to Aging Gratefully, gratefully, not gracefully, has lots of facts, myths, and good news for boomers. So uh, I want to show you that we get to choose how we're going to spend our life. Did you all know that, uh, here's your first trivia question of the day, this is audience participation. The baby boomers are the biggest demographic in the history of humankind. There are 78 million of us. And we're actually living 15 years longer now, so. <laughs> you know, the Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood is a town where the young and the beautiful always get top billing. But you know, the cream rises to the top. And the cream of the crop last year's Academy Award nominees showed that. They were women of a certain age. You had your Meryl Streep. You had your Helen Mirren, you had like, uh, what's she called, Dame Judy Dench. Uh, she's very talented. They're all very high-spirited women who have shown everybody that age is just a number. From the very start, though, my next guest never let her age get in the way of her talents. As a teenager, she graced the stage of the Grand Ole Opry, imagine that, and now she's a triple threat on two TV networks and sings her heart out on her latest CD. Please welcome the beautiful and very talented Cassie DePaiva. Hello, Steve. How are you? Yeah, she said, How are you? <laughs> we have so much in common. Of course, we're both from Kentucky. Aren't we proud women? Yes, go Wildcats, go Wildcats. We both have those southern roots. Um, and you got to sing live at the Grand Ole Opry? Well, you've sung many, 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 many but times. how were you? Like two? I, no, I was 18. I performed down at Opryland before it turned into a shopping mall. But back in 1980 was the first time I performed. And then I performed again when they were having it, their 75th anniversary. And uh, uh, Loretta Lynn was on the bill. It was like, Whoa. oh, my gosh. She was so exciting. Yeah. That is sort of a 10 on the emotional Richter scale. It is. I think I've had a, I've been blessed to have an incredible career so far. You've done so many things. A lot of things, but I, uh, um, I think being on the Grand Ole Opry was probably, to date, the biggest thrill for this Kentucky gal. I mean, it well, was just a big, it was a huge deal It's for live. Me. I mean, you're, you're doing TV, of course, oh, but, yeah. that's, but to have the, that pinch and the ouch and all the people sitting right there live and in person. And then to the know the, the, the legends that have graced that stage, it's just, it's fantastic. It was just terrific for me. And since the topic for our show today is about aging, and you live in Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood. I don't, actually. Here we are, I kind of workish in Hollywood, but I'm a New Yorker. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, you're still young, but have you started to wonder about what's going to happen as the years go by? Every time I look in the mirror, I go, who is that old woman? But it's a... Uh, um, what? No, no, I'm 46. Stop that. And, you know, the aging process is difficult on the ego, but on the spirit, it, I'm lifted up. You know, I, I just feel like I'm getting better. You are, yeah. and I have to give you a copy of my new book because one of my big issues 
is not only just the culture war that we have with Hollywood in general, mm -hmm. but I think they're the biggest purveyors of this real twisted stereotype, and they're not keeping up with the reality. Right. right. We're living 15 years longer. We are better than ever. Well, if you ask somebody, I'm, I'm 46, but how old do I feel? Exactly. I, I, in my mind, I would say I'm 27. That's where I feel. And so I think that's where I live. I don't live in that 46, I mean that 46 year old body, but I feel better at 46 than I did at 26. Amen, sister. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, why do you think, of course everybody knows you as Blair. Yeah. Now, why do you think that she's the, the best character on daytime TV? Because she's a little mean. Oh. She's a, a little ornery. So she's you're playing feisty. against type. Yeah. She's a, um, my husband will probably tell you no. Um, but I think she's fascinating and she's entertaining and she sometimes she wears her clothes just a little bit too tight or dresses a little too short. But she is, I think there's a little bit of Blair in all women. In real life, I don't get to go up and slap somebody in the face or shoot you somebody. You don't? No, God, don't get away with that. <laughs> but, you know, within the realm of Landview, Pennsylvania, on One Life to exactly. Live, I can do that. And it's fun. I get to play out those fantasies and then go well, home they, and be a normal person, hopefully. Actually, my actress daughter says that acting is uh, living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Yes. So you get your anger out safely. Yes, yeah, she's had a great career. Tell us about your hearing impaired your, your passion for helping? Well, my son, many of you know, my son JQ um, will be 10 this year, and he was born deaf, and we didn't really realize that until he was a year old. And at the time, the FDA had not approved the cochlear implant, mm. and he had to be 18 months. So we waited six months, and he wore high-powered um, hearing aids, an FM system. Mm -hmm. And then we were just waiting for that time come where we could implant him and he it was 18 months and then once you're implanted it's about a, a month for it to heal and then they put the the outside apparatus on because it's a surgery and then it's intensive speech therapy and that's where I felt with my fan base helping make parents aware that there are alternatives out there and that you are entitled either through the Board of Education in your own it's state to state and uh, insurance policy to insurance policy oh. but you are entitled to so much and you should never ever just expect somebody else to take care of your child you know as a parent you really have to be active and once we became active if Jake you were sitting right here Naomi you would see that you would not know that he had hearing impaired or because his speech is so perfect so. okay and then this is one I want. You can have it. The co the kooky, you being the kooky mom, these. I crochet. This is about my about 500 hats, um, and I sell them on my website. And all the all the proceeds go to the League for the Heart of Hearing, where JQ received his uh, uh, all of his services. And they're just fun. And they're cute. They they're cute as they could be. Sonia, come over here. Uh -oh. Will you put this on us? I want to see if this will fit over her hair. Oh, mine. Or which, yours. Actually, I'm going to let you choose which one do you like, dear. And this is becoming so popular now. Oh, crochet well, is it over your shoes? <laughs> you, you know what? But it's what? Can you give us an XXX? Here, try that one. You know what's what, what's You're really interesting? Try sport. that one. What's interesting is that crochet. I'm sure that your audience out there, a lot of them, <laughs> we try. You look good. Um, you're going to need a lot more yarn. Crocheting is a great way to relieve stress. No kidding. You know, and it, you think that the, that it's for senior or more seasoned people, but no, young people are really getting turned on to crocheting. Well, it, it makes so much sense because it makes you focus on the here and now. It's called um, pr present moment awareness, mm -hmm. and you have to kind of forget. Uh, when I'll, I'll won't say names, but one of our staff members is trying to quit smoking, uh -huh. and she's doing this at night because it keeps him <laughs> eating. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, I'm it's a great, it's a great thing, and I'm kind of, of the magazine. Well, that's kind of how it all is. started. There's my boy, and yeah, it started. A... We came out on Crochet Magazine, and then now I'm hosting a show for PBS starting in September called Knit and Crochet Today. So it's you know God is good, and, and I'm she being blessed. Sings. Well, she that sings. too. That too. <laughs> You're going to sing for us later. Yes, that's my third I album. I want to love you. Yeah. This is beautiful. Thank you. Can't wait to hear you sing. And uh, you're going to make Sonia one, but 
three times bigger? Yeah, we'll get you some extra okay. yarn sewn Thank in. you very much. Stick around. I want you to be my sidekick today. Okay. Well, up next, we have women who are having the time of their lives. And they're actually redefining themselves in their 60s. We'll be back. Cassie, uh... Paiva just told me she's nervous. I, I can't believe it. I'm always nervous. You're a I think, veteran. But you know, I think nerves. Me, my mom always told me, Cassie, if you're not nervous, that means you don't care. So, well, I care so much. I'm nervous all the time. <laughs> so it's good. Keeps you on your toes. It does. Well, we want to introduce you to some very special women, all in their 60s, or should I say, 60s? Yeah, go girls. <laughs> they are ready for prime time. Check it out. <laughs> I tell people how old I am because I'm fascinated by how old I am. The second time I went to the Amazon, I was 60 years old, and I climbed up to Angel Falls, which is the highest fall in the world. He's always <laughs> saying, and I just don't know what I think about sleeping with a 64-year-old year -old woman. <laughs> well, it's no different than me sleeping with a 69-year-old man. <laughs> when I'm 70, I'm going to be elegant. I've decided that that's my goal. At 60, you basically have nothing to lose, and it's a wonderful feeling. Look at Helen Mirren winning the Oscar at 60, and no one made a big deal about it being an old lady award in the 1960s. We're the generation who thought we were going to change the world, but the reality is that now that we are in our 60s, we are changing the world. I'm Juliana Halas, and I'm 63 years old, and I'm absolutely fabulous. I went to the Amazon first when I was 19 years old. I was in college, and my parents saw because I was so much into adventure that I was a hippie. I went to Malawi last year, and one of the things that most impressed me about the people of Malawi, they have had AIDS. They don't have time to feel sorry for themselves. They just go ahead and help out the children that are orphaned from AIDS. I felt that if something needed to be done, you just cannot sit back and just say, oh, I feel sorry for them, so I don't want to see it. Mr. Lee Johnson just donated $500. Thank you so much, Dominic. Our Institute for Family Development International is an institute run by us women of a group of friends that have decided to join together, and our mission is to empower women and children. Juliana and her organization have shown that rare and unique ability to, to raise up and take action during uh, these fights against HIV and AIDS. I love being 60, and 63 even better. The more it goes up, the better it gets. I need those dimples, come on. Okay, bring your eyes back to me. Yeah, nice. So. I became a photographer at 50 and a successful one. Now, Stanley, I want you to go like this and then turn and look back over your shoulder at me. I think that I bring a different look to wedding photography because of being in my 60s and my life experiences. I don't photograph people, I photograph feelings. And there is such a difference to capture those moments that, that touch your heart. Our daughter Jennifer died of cancer when she was 16 years old. And one of the things that she said to us just days before she died, she wanted her ashes buried at Eel Rock under an oak tree with a view. And I said, how can you do that to us, Jennifer? And she said, you know, Mom, if you turn all of our good memories into nightmares, I feel sorry for you. So she's buried under that oak tree with a view. She's still here with us. It's delicious, Mark. It's really it needs a little salt. <laughs> <laughs> Kale was an exchange student with us when I was in my 30s. And when our daughter was uh, diagnosed, she came back on a visit, and we introduced her to the town bachelor, and she married him. She's a gift. She has two daughters that are granddaughters to us, and we just feel like they are our gift from God. I discovered West African dance in my mid-50s. I've been doing that for about nine years. When I was a kid, women my age were restricted in what they were mostly allowed to wear. They only wore dresses, stockings, and heels, and 
dark, solid colors. And they certainly mostly weren't doing West African dance or probably much dancing at all. Well, I never had children. Um, so that's part of the reason I decided to become a mentor. Alyssa, do you want cider? Um, sure. Okay, you can get some cider too. She opens up my perspective and gives me an opportunity to think about things in a different way. Oh, cool. And then she's just fun. I enjoy her a lot. Up to my dad's death when he was 83, my dad said that he still felt 18 inside. He continued to grow and change his whole life, and my mom is the same way. I was thinking about that expression that 60 is, is the new 40, and I actually think that it's, it's younger than that. I tried to push it to 30. I think I kind of settled on the new 35. People are always trying to scare women by saying that if you're over 50 or 55 or 60 or 65 that you can't find love. You can't find certainly the love of your life, but that's not true. I did, and it didn't take me very long either. Playing with half a deck here, are we? That's kind of how we live, isn't it? I think so. I put an ad in that said, looking for a strong man with broad shoulders who loves to fish. Well, it's Trump. Right. How lucky am I? Whoop. <laughs> I have no doubt of our need to be together. Just keep being who you are. I am honored to be loved by you. Yours forever, John. We've both found this to be the happiest time in our lives. I think so. Yeah. It's been wonderful. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Why don't we get a glass of wine so we can toast Anna? Absolutely. Oh, yay. yay. Good. Right. One of the most important things that a woman learns in midlife, over mid-50s, is that friends are not just important. Friends are everything. Friends are what get you through. In fact, we have to meet in each other's homes because we're so noisy in a restaurant, we can't go there anymore. <laughs> Welcome to the best years of your life. Yes. I, uh, oh, you lucky. You're yes. now growing up. The big you six Well, my friends, I'm going to laugh. That's how I feel about my girlfriend. I bet you're rowdy. I'm very <laughs> rowdy. So stick around because, Cassie, when we come back, we're going to get to meet the gal who wrote this book that was inspired by these ladies. Can't wait. Stick around. Cassie DePiva and our next guest says that the 60s, yes, are the time to explore and look forward to. Her book, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be 60, is a celebration of a decade number six. Please welcome the very young at heart, Wendy Reed Crisp. Thank you. <laughs> we did it. I was just, I was just sharing. I, I told Cassie and... Uh, I, I just told you how I got this book. I was at Maya Angelou's house, and she gave me this book. I'm very blown away that Maya Angelou would have a copy of my book. I but think that's well, lovely. Very my, flattering. But as I said, the, the book about being over 50, which I'm delighted that she has, but I wish she had this one because this one's so much more spiritual and profound. Well, you're going to autograph this, and I'll send it to her. Okay, good. Because she's a friend of mine. Consider it done. I am so <laughs> flattered. Okay, now you say in here you're not going to drink light beer. You're just going to go for it. Okay, that's, that's something I still definitely believe in. Either you drink or you don't <laughs> drink, but you don't drink light beer. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. What or sugar-free ice cream. You know, yes, either no. Yes, that's in there. That's right. And you do said, it all or forget it. You said that you're you're not going to quit wearing uh, big earrings. I see you I still. I never did. Right. <laughs> so, what do you think is the difference between uh, women who are 40, 50, and 60? I think it's, I think it's a cr tremendously interesting thing that there is such a significant difference. At 40, you're just beginning to reflect and understand the wisdom of what you've been through. I was I listening to you, Cassie, yes. and your story is just remarkable and special because you've taken adversity, you've faced it, you've embraced it, you've taken the wisdom from it, you've become who you are, and you're finding a new path. You don't have to it. apologize. Either. Right, exactly. And that's exactly what begins to happen in 40. And then it, at 50, 
you be, there's a declaration of independence at 50. I love that. That's, that's different. True. It's different. You feel like, and like you said, uh, something about uh, my career has gone well so far, something like yes. that. At 50, you're going to say, yeah, <laughs> I don't care how my career goes. This is who I am, honey. Take yep. it or yep. leave it. You, you cross a barrier at 50. And at 60, the independence that you've developed through your 50s at 60 suddenly becomes an independence that is aimed at taking your, what you have in you now, the wisdom and the strength, and turning it outwards. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you say, not only am I independent, not only am I strong, but there's something that needs to be done, and I'm the one to do it. And it's, there's a very strong feeling at 60 that you have nothing else to lose. You know, like freedom's just another thing yeah. for nothing else to lose. <laughs> at 60, you really believe that. What have you got to lose at 60? You know, you don't, ha you don't have a reputation to lose. You either have one or you don't, and who cares? <laughs> and you don't have, uh, you know, you, you have to accept at that point that you don't look like you're 20 anymore, and it doesn't matter because you don't want to be, like Cassie was saying, she felt 27, but I'm sure that the woman oh, she was her. at 27 wasn't this oh, woman. Oh, I was, I was still trying yeah. to please my parents. Sure. I hadn't grabbed the baton. We're all airheads I'm, you know, at 27. Right. You know, we don't want to be that woman mm -hmm. anymore. Well, and if this is what we have to look like to not be that woman, I'll take they, this. They say the number one cause for unhappiness is not knowing who you are. And I figured out who I am, what I stand for, what my beliefs and values are. And that's everything. When you figure out who the heck you are, you don't let them tell you. You're and not following you somebody else's it. dream. Then you go for it. Then you say, how do I make this make things better for other people? How do I change the world with who I am? And you're on marriage number three. Yes. You're actually, going for Liz Taylor's I'm, record? No, I'm actually, <clears throat> actually, I'm, this is my final marriage. <clears throat> but it is marriage number four. Four? Okay. There was a very brief, unfortunate, teensy-weensy moment. <laughs> <laughs> because it turns out you can still make mistakes in your 50s. This may come as a big shock. No, yeah, right. You and I need to have margaritas after the show. Let's all go out. Y'all be the rowdy group. Not have, yeah. You have to have them at your home because y'all be too rowdy. Isn't that, isn't that a terrible yeah. thing to discover? Because you really do think at a certain point that you're a grown-up, and then you do something really dumb and find out you're still not a grown-up. Well, Wendy, we certainly can't fault you for wanting to love. You know, you, you fell in love with the wrong guy for the right reasons. It just was the wrong guy. Maybe he's the one that made the mistake. It wasn't you. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. He certainly did. There you but go. But it sure shows you can make mistakes. It's okay. You learn. After then. 50. Life is a process. You're yeah. never going to be able to eat or sleep or drink once and for all. Every day it's a process. Now, you said during break that, that these are people that you actually know. The women in the 60 book are, are all people that I no, most of them are, a lot of them are lifetime friends or neighbors or, for example, my son's mother-in-law or my cousin, their family members. They are all people and I ask them all to choose an S word because of 60 being an S word that represented how they feel or what they've learned about this age and they chose sexy and sensual and they also chose sad and selfish and soaring and self-sufficient and uh, significant. One of the women says, I'm not going to be insignificant. Oh. I'm not going to walk into a room and be dismissed because I'm an older woman. That's and empowering. Isn't that? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Has to start your with S word. S. This, I'm going to take this to my, my I'd be silly because now. I think being finding your silly self is finding that that five-year-old in you, and I think you shouldn't have to apologize for being silly. You know, that's so <laughs> wonderful, Cassie, because I'm the, silly. one of the last <laughs> women in here who was my neighbor in New York chose silly, and mm -hmm. she said, with my own kids, I was uptight, but with my grandkids, I don't care who's there, I'm in the middle of the floor singing the wheels of the bus go round and round. Yeah. For me, it's secure. Oh, yeah. It has to be secure. Why, why Absolutely, secure? because... So it's over 60, all grown up, and now I'm secure. I know who the heck I am. And I'm so much more compassionate towards other people because I always wonder, what's your story when you go home? Right. And also about how we look. One of the interesting exactly. things you learn is that only we care what we look like. Other people care what we think of them. Are we paying attention to them? They're not saying, you know, they don't care what you look like. If you think they're wonderful, they think you're beautiful. It, it's interesting, though, as working in television, and I am so mindful of what I look like because people will let me know, you're gaining weight, you're doing this, you're, you know. And so I have to be physically aware of my weight and aging process, but it's, you know, God's good, and I just try to do everything I can to take care of myself. 
part of your work also is the image that you inspire with sure. other people, and they see themselves, they're reflecting themselves in oh, you sure. and your character. Sure, sure, sure. So it's a little bit different than a non-character person. Sure. But I am interested in what's the difference between men and women at 60? A lot. Really? A lot of differences. I don't think that men are as comfortable aging as women are, because men traditionally... You get, think so too? They get so much wow. of their, well, so much of their identity is from two things, having power, over other people mm -hmm. or, and having physical strength. And after they retire, suddenly they don't have a staff or a crew or whatever it is. That identity. Mm -hmm. And they begin to lose physical strength. You know, it's like Bambi and his dad. You know, the younger <laughs> guys are, you know, yeah. able to carry the dresser downstairs. He's not. So uh, they don't know where, who else they are. They haven't spent any time being very reflective, oh, like we do, and talking to their friends about who they am I. They don't do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the point, what we're well, they go outside the cave. We go in the cave. And, and they do, stay. Do, 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 do. But they, now that they get over 60, it's hard to get them out of their cave. Really? You know, I don't think I, I'm not going downtown for a drink. You know, it's four miles. Um, they like, they don't like to leave their living room, you know, they, because they're not sure yet anymore who they are. They're, they're this not is, secure and they're not silly. The last thing that you said in the book is that this is uh, things you're not going to do now that you're over a certain age. You said you're not going to quit. quit. We don't want you to. <laughs> we want yeah. to want to see the next decade. Thank you so much Thank for, you. for being fun. with Wendy's us. Thank lovely. you. Do you have a story of your own that you want to share with us? What are you waiting for? We want you to go to faithstreams.com and then click on Naomi's New Morning Message Board. Stay with us. <laughs>So I'm not very good at numbers, but when I found out that there are 78 million, million baby boomers in America and that we're the largest demographic in the history of humankind, I wanted to check it out. So I went down to Washington, D.C. to hang out with the CEO of AARP. Bill Novelli is leading the revolution. You've got a fabulous book out here, and it's a good read. Thank you. You know, Thank I you. like the fact that it was small. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> But it's so chocked full of uh, very relevant information. The first question I have to ask you, I already know the answer, but why did you write this book? I think that uh, this is a very optimistic time that we live in. I think you agree with that. And uh, what we've got here is the boomers, as you say, uh, 78 million of them coming into mm -hmm. their older years. Mm -hmm. And we've all got longevity, as you said. And so this is our opportunity to really, really change the country. And it needs changing. We've been a success and now we can be significant, as you say. Yeah, exactly so. I mean, we have got a great country. We've got the ability to reinvent ourselves, and we're going to do it. So what do we need to do? What, well, what are the folks out there as need individuals, to do? As You're individuals, we need to take personal responsibility uh, for ourselves. We need to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. We need to exercise. We need to watch our weights. We sure uh, need to quit smoking if we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and do the kinds of things for ourselves and our family that will make a difference in our lives. But that's half of it. The other half, Naomi, is to get out there and really be an activist, yeah. to do something in our communities, in our states, for the country, to really create change. Uh, there are so many stories in the book about people who are leaving legacies. And sure, part of it is leaving your valuables or your land, but the more important part is what we leave behind that we've really contributed to society and to our families. I know that you've taken on the tobacco industry. In my time, I have. Yes, yes. and the health. I say uh, it's the wealth industry instead of the health care industry, the wealth care industry. And I wish managed care would manage to care. Speak into that. Well, um, health care in our country, as you know, doesn't work. I uh -huh. mean, it is a broken system. Uh -huh. And we need to fix it. And we've got time and we've got the ability to do it, but only if we start acting now. There are a whole series of things that we need to do. None of this is really rocket science. It, it all is understood. Or it rocket all can surgery. Be done. Or rocket surgery. <laughs> and we need people to basically demand change, to be good health consumers. I'm a very simple, practical sort, Bill, and I love what AARP is doing for um, prescription drugs for seniors. This well, is your chance. <laughs> Tell those, those people out there. Well, um, drugs in this country cost too much, and we worked very, very hard to get drug coverage into Medicare, and now we have it there. And uh, most people are, are satisfied with the so-called Part D part of Medicare, the drug part, but it can be made better. 
but half our members are between 50 and 65, mm -hmm. and they're not eligible for Medicare, and drugs cost so much for them. So we've got a lot of work to do in this country to make drugs affordable for everybody. And let's face it, you can't practice modern medicine without prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. It keeps people working, it keeps them out of hospitals and nursing homes. I mean, we need to really do something about this. By the way, I embrace aging. My book is called Aging Gratefully. Right. I've never had an issue about birthdays. I celebrate them and, and embrace them and look forward to them. However, when I got my first AARP piece of mail, um, I, th I thought, no, I'm never going to retire. Um, does that bother you that the word retirement is in AARP? Well, actually, Naomi, it isn't. Um, about 12 years ago, we changed the name of the organization, and it's no longer the American Association for Retired People. It's now just AARP, just the letters. And the reason for that is that half our members are not retired. They're either working full-time, they're working part-time, and among those who are retired, some of them are coming back into work. Mm -hmm. So I can understand you're not liking the word retired. It's, a, it's an old-fashioned word. There's a whole chapter in the book about the workforce. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there are more 65 and older workers now than ever before, mm -hmm. more 55 and older workers, and the age of retirement, so-called, is beginning to inch up. So older workers are becoming more and more important. And what's really gratifying is that companies have figured this out. So thank a lot of companies, goodness. Yes, thank goodness, they're developing <laughs> strategies to attract and keep their older workers. And I can frankly say that when I wa walk into the hospital clinical setting, I wanted to hang out with the older nurses. Those, and because there's, you can't learn stuff from books. You know, give me a person that has that sagacious, um, encyclopedic range of experience, those are the ones you want to work side by side with. People who have lived. Yeah. I agree. I hope you're never going to retire. We <laughs> need you. <laughs> well, I've retired many times. <laughs> oh, really? No, I'm just kidding. I think of retirement as renewal. Oh. Uh, as you do. I mean, it's not, a, it's, it's not the old rocking chair no. kind of retirement. I just love um, the incredible sense of optimism. Thank you. Thank you. There's not only empirical data, facts uh, to support. Of course, you're, you're very respectful of uh, your position, and you back everything up. But what I took away from this book was, <sighs> <laughs> I'm so proud to be over 50 because uh, we're now celebrating yeah. all the well, beneficial advantages. I, I sense in you a person who believes that uh, as much as I do. I think we're both, you know, the glass is three quarters full. Mm -hmm. And if you are an optimist um, and you have all the different opportunities that we have in this great country, why not? I mean, why not do something? Why not do great things? Well, you're the Grand Marshal in the parade. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you Bill so Novelli. Much. Pleasure. Live well and be well. Thank you. Next, we've got a group of grannies that have game off and on the court. We're going to be right back with you. Naomi's New Morning, next Sunday morning at 11 on Hallmark Channel. Welcome back. In Iowa, the corn grows tall, and the girls' basketball is much more than a pastime. You are going to see some grannies who are on a mission to preserve the history of 1920s girls' basketball. That would be bloomers and all, I think. Uh-oh. Let's check them out. <laughs> It was kind of an accident. The ideas just happened to come together one night, and I woke up and thought, ta-da, a granny basketball team. It's just kind of taking on a life of its own. You have to be 50 years old and be able to breathe. That's about it. You don't have to be very good, you just have to be willing to come out and put your body on the line. <laughs> I grew up in Des Moines. We didn't get to play basketball. Our principal said, no, we couldn't do that, it wasn't ladylike. And so now I have the opportunity to do that and I'm very happy about it. The best part is it suspends reality for a while. When I leave the house at night and say, I'm going to basketball practice, aches and pains go away, wrinkles disappear for a few minutes, and I'm 16 again. I could hardly raise my arms when I first started back. And now I can, I can shoot pretty good baskets. 
personally, I, it was the best thing that's happened to me for a long time. Some of the older people, they don't like some of the activities like I do. They, they wouldn't think of getting out there and shooting a basket if they would just try. I say, get out of your rocking chair and get some exercise, you know. When I was growing up in Lansing and my dad was a coach, he liked coaching girls better than boys because they were, they were easier to deal with. I was always too little. I, when I was in high school, I weighed about 90 pounds and it was five feet two, and I just bounce off of people. So now it's kind of fun to play because I'm a little bigger. Over the line. Refereeing I do because I can't find any men referees as a rule that will call what we want called. No touching. The rules are different now because we don't allow running or jumping or physical contact. We don't allow hovering, uh, so we don't want the tall people to have all the advantages of hovering over the top of the short ones. These were 1920 uniforms. They wore bloomers and long socks. Girls weren't supposed to show any flesh then, and so that's perfect for us because we don't want to show any flesh now either. We have fun with every game. Sure, there's a little bit of competition here and there, but I'll tell you what, if we walk away without winning, it doesn't matter. We still went there and had fun and we had exercise. We have several ladies that didn't get to play in high school and now they're reliving their youth and taking advantage of the opportunity. We're not ready for the rocking chair yet. We're mostly at an age where we're either retired or getting ready to retire. We're done trying to make money. We're done running around after our kids. And so now they can run around after us. <laughs> Fun. Shooting seniors. They're going to die with their tennies on. You know, that those outfits just kill me. The one thing they didn't say is I bet they've got really good support bras. There you go. They are adorable. <laughs> now, did you, were you athletic? Did you play basketball? No, I play, I practice piano. Uh, I kept my room clean, made all A's. I was one of those. Aren't you perfect? Well, no. <laughs> with my height, everybody goes, oh, did you play basketball? No. My brother says, get out of here. That's a girl. You know, you're a girl. Go play Barbies. And that's pretty much what I did. And the one of them was, what did she say, 5'2 and 90 pounds and Oh, yeah, pounds she's 90 pounds when she was in high school. And but I love the rules. Up. I love that they make up Don't the touch. Room. No running, no hovering. <laughs> and all the tall people, don't touch. This works. That works. I can do that. Hoop shooting seniors. Uh, well, next, what's the one thing that you think you need that might help you age gratefully, gratefully, like all the other folks on today's show? We're going to tell you one answer when we come back. Uh, Cassie DePiva this morning, and we've been showing that age really is just a number. Yes, it is. Now, you wrote the book on aging gratefully. Yes. What, what, what would you give me? What was your number one tip on aging gratefully? Uh, I would say be defined from within. That means figuring out what your beliefs and values are. One of my big issues, uh, and you and I are kindred spirits in this realm, is that uh, I think Hollywood has to convince us that we're wrong by all these horrible stereotypes mm -hmm. who will buy all their stuff. It's very difficult, and it's very difficult to not feel that I am being duplicitous when I say I'm du I, I, in television, but I am not of television. I certainly, you know, soap operas put out, we try to deal with issues, mm -hmm. but then we also put out some things that I probably i am not really comfortable with, mm. but it's my job, and, um, it, but it's interesting, and I think you know, what it's we, not who you are. No. It's what you do, but it's not no. who you are. No, it's certainly not who I am. Well, in uh, La La Land out there, it breeds insecurity. Absolutely. So, and in this day of post 9-11, we don't need to be any more insecure. But you and I have been visiting off camera, and I'm glad that you're a believer. Because when you know, when oh, you yeah. have a connection to your higher power, that keeps you focused. Absolutely. I think we also have to have a very, we really need to be more socially aware and responsible now more than ever. Because we are... We have children, and they are like sponges, and they absorb everything. And we're putting out things that aren't really necessarily healthy for their mind, body, or spirit. My mama says that she uh, thinks that uh, 
my life is a soap opera. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> is. If you ever had your own, your own private life, your own private camera, it'd be scary. It's like the Judds are a, a comedy, drama, thriller, suspense, soap opera that can't be canceled. Yeah, the reality show. <laughs> the ultimate reality show. But what we're trying to say today is that your life is the ultimate reality show. We want you to start paying attention to your life. Absolutely. But we're glad you watch our show here. We're called Tell a Vision. We try to <laughs> tell a vision. My name is Naomi Judd. Hi, Mom. See, I'm, I'm with a soap opera yeah. actress. Is that close? Um, Hi, Mom. <laughs> yes. And I want you to remember that um, you do have a support group here with us. My mind is always going to be open for you. My door will never be closed. And there's always going to be plenty of room for you right here at our table. And now here she is, the always lovely Cassie DePiva singing a song from her brand new CD, I Want to Love You. Yay! You Thank you. Smiling at the sun in the morning Remembering the colors in my dreams And I've been talking to God a lot more often Since you said you loved me Well, I've been sitting back down at my piano Singing songs from 1983 Well, I've been driving with my hand hung out the window Since you said you love me That I've tossed out to the sea Wishing I'd sealed them in a jar For safekeeping Since you said you loved me strangers on the street and I've been liking that girl more in the mirror since you said you loved me ever since you said you loved me oh since you said you loved me